All right, welcome to Victory the Podcast. I'm Doug Ellen. I am Kevin Connolly. Kevin Dillon is in Cannes. He's Can in Film France, Fest. right? I mean, I, it's so weird. I feel like he's like one of my closest friends and my brother, and we work together and we hang out. We, right. We don't golf together, but we do everything else. And all of a sudden, he's in Cannes. I didn't he know. just thinks not. I mean, he kind of mentions it in passing, but then you look on his social media, and there he is, like on the red carpet, looking like James Bond with yeah. Amy May. He's like James Bond meets Forrest Gump. Yeah, but it's a good video of him. It looked good. Oh, it looked well performed. Who do you figure shot that? Who shoots that? I was wondering who shot it. I was wondering who who got him to post it and Michael Bublé music under it. Like it's just yeah, it's got Amy, Amy May. It's got Amy May written all over it. But they look great. They look great. They look great. Yeah. So, um, do you think more people knew Kevin Dillon on the red carpet this time than the Entourage cast on the red carpet in Canada? Oh, I would. In I would imagine that absolutely. Yeah. I would imagine that absolutely. But it. In any event, we have a very, very, very special episode. A very special. Yeah, I mean, listen, we have uh, David Nutter. One of the biggest, most successful television directors of all time. I mean, it's really incredible. And, I, and I'm wondering if we should discuss his accolades now or we should wait till he's here. I don't think we need to discuss his accolades with him. We well, can ask him about specific things. But Nutter, which, what's, okay. Just he so did whoever, 10 episodes of Entourage, David Nutter. Okay, all right. I was about to jump in, okay. Connolly has done research again, which is is so great, but also it's annoying because um, what I wanted him to do research on the show from the get go, and he refused because he's a wing it kind of guy, which is fine. But when he does do research, I prepare for big guests. He tends to push me out of the way, which is fine. I don't like that. But you want to borrow my sheet. You want to borrow my research sheet? I, I just want to know how we're going to work together because you kind of like, I mean, I, I don't need to be here besides for the, the hat if you want to make fun of me. Well, no, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I, dude, you, your confidence in this hat is so overwhelming that I, 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 know, I have no words. I, I don't have anything to say. I can't even knock you for it. Well, I want to talk about a couple of, of things confidence. about this. So I went back to Dr. Zeering. I got a second. This was an F-U-E hair. What does that mean? What is F-U-E? What is, is that an acronym <laughs> for something? It probably is, but I don't know what it is. But the F-U-T I did last year, and they cut into the back of your head for some reason, like, right. and, and then they take cares. This one, they don't cut into the back of your head. I have so no the T in the ear, what, what's different? Yeah, and the F-U-E is newer technology, but for some reason I did the F-U-T last year. You got year. the cheap version first time? Around? No, 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 no. But, but I also want to say, because so many people ask me about this, because so many men actually care about it. And by the way, women too. It's a lot of women who have some hair loss that this really works incredibly well for. So anyway. Are you wearing this hat for... No, I'm wearing this hat because my head is not supposed to be exposed to sun, and right. because I have, I have like uh, you know red dots that right. head, you would is throw head, up. Is it hurt? Does your head hurt? It hurts sleeping. Is it tender? I, I've been having a hard time sleeping. Could you put a hat on top of the? I am of the not hat? supposed to put a hat on my head. Right. So for this like is 10 supposed days. to be it. This is what you're supposed to be. Doing. I'm really this not, is not supposed for to have content. anything on my head, and okay. uh, so we're going to talk about that. But anyway, I did this one a year ago, and then I, can't I did, believe it's been a year, and then I did this second one, and the results the first time, Doctor Zeering were. They're off the charts. You even said to me at Ted Fox and Bar Mitzvah that you didn't think I needed another one. My girlfriend said it too. Now, you go into a room like this with lights like that at Dr. Zeering's, and then they, f they, they put the lights on you, and you know when you don't have every bit of hair that you would want. But here's the worst thing that, that, that's happened over the last 48 hours, because Zeering is amazing. I think he's a genius. It ain't cheap, okay? It's not the cheapest thing you in the world. tell me he didn't give you a deal. He probably gave me a deal, but as I've said on this podcast You've before, very good to doctors. I just wanted him happy. I don't want deals. I you don't want, want a guy working on your head on a deal. No, I don't want guys right. cutting into my brain stem when they're not happy with the, with the price. But anyway, two things happened. One, I posted a picture, which was nothing, uh, just my head mostly shaved, which I've never had in my life. And I got 300 comments where people are like, dude, you look cool. Venner, the most negative motherfucker on the planet Earth, our genius musical guy. He's like, you look good, Rob Weiss. What, or, like with, with going like the 80s, like shaved head, like high and tight? I don't even know if it's 80s anymore. It's I guess it's like, I'm not really stylish, but like the fade on the side and whatever. Right. Um, so I got a lot it's of- It's not you though. I got all, it doesn't feel like me, but I got a lot of comments that they like it. I got a lot of comments that I looked like Brooke, Brooks Kepka, which made me feel very oh, nice. Oh God. Colin you, doesn't you like that. I knew Brooks Kepka. <laughs> you know Brooks Kepka. And who, um, by the way, Jenna Sims, who is his fiance, was on Entourage. She was yeah, in the Jerry and, Jones episode. And uh, if I'm not, Sophie Julia is going to their wedding, I believe. Oh really? Yeah, well, yeah, Sophie that's Sims. right. 
And well, I wonder if Sophie saw me today and thought Brooks was in the house. I anyway, thought she thought you were Brooks. Guy. So anyway, but wait, let me let me just finish this. So two please, things happen. Please finish. A lot of people tell me it looked good like that, which you know, if that was the case, I didn't need to spend any money. I could have shaved my head and uh, and just gone that way. If that's the case, looked like Bruce Willis, whatever. The second thing is, last night someone tweets at me that there's some experimental pill that just came out that le- allegedly can take a bald head, <laughs> and, and I have not been bald, you know, I just had thinning hair, and, and give you, like, all your hair back. Listen, if that you would happened, think in this day and age, I, I mean, I, I guess coming. it's a research thing, but you would think, I mean, come on, with what they can do, you'd think they'd be able to give people... <sighs> Well, you would think, but uh, if that happened after I went through all this. By the way, you want to hear a little bit of breaking news? Sophie Julia is leaving Action Park Media. Whoa. Now, yeah. does everyone know who Sophie is? Who works Sophie on the Julia, Entertainer podcast? Sophie Julia produces? produces the Entertainer. But we got to tell the Entertainer girls. We probably should mention that to the Entertainer girls before this drops. Why is she leaving? But, uh, she, got a, she got another job. She got a very, she got a great offer. She's going to stay on as a... Uh, Kelly Stafford's producer. Um, so she's just she's going to be involved in some capacity. But, you know, listen, it's uh, it's the America's the land of opportunity. She got a job offer that she wants to take, and uh, she's still going to pop in to do Kevco. Now, were you uh, this positive about her? You didn't pull a, if you walk away from this, you'll never, ever be allowed back in here. No, 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 no. We didn't know. It's, 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 it's all love, and it's, it couldn't be a better parting of ways, even though it's not even really parting ways because she's still going to be around. Right. She's still a producer of our, our second biggest show, Doug. Oh, uh, which victory. is... Kelly Stafford. Kelly Stafford. Kelly Stafford. Rambalon's coming up. Rambalon's pulling. Yeah, we're 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 Rambalon's growing. By the way, if Rambalon gets picked up. That's a hot piece of IP. Yeah. Well, then we'll probably leave Action Park for that. Yeah, up. I was gonna say you go back to podcast one. <laughs> um, all right. So this weekend I had uh, <clears throat> we went to the christening. I had a christening this weekend. Well, you didn't go to the. I mean, I guess you went to it, but oh, you, we it's went, your christening. I mean, yeah, I know, but I, I, look, you the threw thought, the christening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The six thousand dollars. The, the thought, the that thought that was that I was going to go. The christening's in New York, right? And you know, it's where I'm from. This is your daughter. This is my daughter, Kennedy's christening. Zulai's family's in New Jersey. My family's in New York. It's been COVID, but I, I don't know what I was thinking when I booked these flights. But it was seventy two hours, and the the airplane flight with Kennedy torture. I mean, honestly. It was it, it was one of the worst experiences I've ever. No, not even. It, it's the worst experience I've ever had on a plane ever in yeah. my life. Ever. The way back, the way there, the way back. It was terrible, terrible, terrible. I, you know, uh, when I had my kids, Lucas who played Ari's son. You know, I used to tell my ex-wife, "I'm like, I'm not flying with them unless it's an emergency." And the, I, I remember I was on with my son at five, six years old, which is obviously older than this. It was one of the, the flights that changed the rules. Jet blue. We were stuck on the, on the tarmac for oh, eight God. I, hours. I don't, I don't know what we would have done. I, I mean, know. I'm telling you, people were ready to kill people, which I don't know if you saw that fight um, that was <laughs> at United Airlines where an bizarre. ex-NFL player, you know, um, but it oh, looked he like that guy. No, but I saw the longer video. So who started it? The 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 um, I think the football player has probably got himself uh, in some trouble because they did fire the airline employee today. I did see the airline employee be real close to him talking and sucker punch him. Right. And then even after that guy knocked him on his ass, he got, he up. got up and was ready to keep going. He got up. Listen, I, it was it was. I mean, I have a whole new. Um, I, I have to apologize for for many years of. <laughs> Flying on a plane with people with babies and not being a little bit more understanding, kind of thinking to myself, like, shut this kid up. Because, you know, the ears are popping. It's tough, man. There's nothing it's you can tough. Do. There's nothing you can do. And, and everybody was really, um, everybody was really supportive and every, people were actually kind of nice. But Did you have us, anyone that wasn't? Because I would love to see you. I was on a plane once where I actually made communication with a guy who said he worked in distribution at, at Warner Brothers. So they were somehow involved with Entourage. And either Lucas or Maya, one of my kids, was crying badly at the end of the flight. And that guy turned from being my friend to really getting nasty to the point we almost had a fight. I yeah, mean, I, 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 was, uh, I, was, I was very – I had a deep inner dialogue <laughs> To make sure that I didn't take any of that stuff too personally. Yeah. And I was like going out for a beautiful christening, which we had a great time. The christening itself was awesome, but the travel was just Did you take any part of my language? Fucking murder. No, and not only that, and I'm I mean, a guy alcohol, I'm anything. a guy that gets on a plane and like has a couple glasses of wine to relax. I had coffee. 
So no, oh, that's for the first time. That's well, no, because I had to stay alert, chasing the kid around, walking the <laughs> kid up and down the aisle. I had to stay. I had to be on the top of my game. But uh, you got my. T- I sent. I sent you an accidental text. Yeah, obviously you had a rough weekend because I'm just minding my own business, sitting at my uh, uh, computer working, trying to make Kevin Conley a star again. And uh, I get, I love you, babe. So I, I didn't. I thought for a minute maybe you saw the new Ramble on Cut. <laughs> These Ramble on Cuts. I said I love you. No, you know it's funny, and it just goes to show how often you and I text on my text thing there's the two most common at the top of my text it's you and Zulai. Yeah. So I meant to send that to Zulai obviously, but I sent it to you. Yeah. And then I got a text back from you calling me a weirdo. And I thought, what? I <laughs> oh, you didn't even know what I didn't know until yeah. you wrote back weirdo. I was like, oh God. But um yeah, needless to say it was a big I think it was Zulai and I were ready to kill each other on, on the plane along. It's just really, really, really stressful. Um it's a so really that's hard thing gonna to that's gonna kids. be it. For the foreseeable future. I just, I, I mean, Traveling listen, two hours, you know, two and a half hours, but the five hour cross country thing, it's just, it's just not for me. I don't think there's so any I was, reason I was to telling Zulai, I love you, babe, because yeah, we had a rough outing on Sunday nights, on Monday. Uh, that was an apology, probably. Not an apology, just like, listen, it was, here's the thing, the christening itself was so awesome. But the travel part of it was just, yeah, I mean, it's horrible. And travel now is even worse. Right. It's just I mean, like, I was almost like we were, I was almost like hallucinating. Do you have to be in a mask? Because I have to travel. No, Friday. you don't have to have a mask anymore. You don't have the mask. Although, and, and, I, there was not one mask on the plane. And then, by the way, COVID, again, forgetting anyone who wants to yell about being scared, it is everywhere. Every five seconds, someone's getting it again now. I know. So, I just, I just, I'm, I'm just at the point, and I think you're there too. I just can't. I, I do my best, I wash my hands. I'm fucking got 42 vaccinations. Yeah. I, I, it's, I just got to I don't, life, I don't think know? that it's anything that you can do about it. The problem is, is, you know, if you're, you know, I stressed for two weeks before we filmed our new scene. Cause I, if one of the three of you actors, I know. myself, our cinematographer and, I and a few other people, I was just like, we'll be out a hundred thousand dollars. Well, and, and truthfully, anybody will tell you, I mean, I skipped my hockey game. Uh, on Wednesday night, I skipped because I would. I, God forbid, I blew out my knee or something. Yeah, God forbid. Shot. God forbid the team <laughs> could play without you. By the way, yeah. Thursday night was the Kings game that I skipped. I literally quarantined for those last few days, just thinking like, you know, whatever. But the other thing I wanted to say to you too, Doug. You and I talked about, and and again, we just watched the cut of the scene of the new scene from Ramble on, and we I, we had the thought of, um, you know, in a disaster, like if it had to be you or I that got COVID. Like, you almost could have done it remotely, but... Yeah, if you had COVID, we're done. Right, but uh, but I, I guess my point of what I'm saying is, like, that's some of the best work I've seen you do on a set in terms of... Ooh. Yeah, in terms of... Again, I don't want to get too far into ramble on because I'm sure Doug and Ted will talk about it for no, hours but, on their podcast. But, but, for, but for me, like the the reason why we shot that scene is... And whatever, we don't want to give anything away. People will see it. But the problem that existed in that scene that day existed in the last cut. And at the end of the day, we needed to work through that scene because it just, it just sometimes those problems exist in stories. And I don't think that that would have uh, worked out. Like there's a world where you, me and Gary, right. Could have said, all right, keep, we'll stay on book. We'll do options and this and that, but we needed you there to knock us over the goal line. So great work. Uh, yeah, I really behind the camera. And, and, and what I'll say for everybody who's listening, you know, and I know this is victory. There's a couple of angry people who are like, if you talk about anything but entourage, I want you dead. I mean, people are crazy. Yeah, so but we're understand. talking about filmmaking. Yeah, well. we're talking about filmmaking, but we're also talking about this is our new show, and right. hopefully, this is going to be our next five years. Well, hopefully. And and I believe, you know, I, I just as clearly as I can say it, this show was great a month and a half ago. This show is infinitely yeah, no, better now. Yeah, no, that was smart. I mean, like, look, you had your first cut. You got you got some good notes from some smart people, and then we uh, we made it better. And, you know, props to Foxman for getting in there. And uh, Yeah, so so that's a good point. Cause so I spoke to Charlie yesterday, and he, he was talking to Martin. He just told him about the scene, but Charlie goes, Charlie said about me, he goes, this guy is fucking crazy. He's like, he, he said, Francis Ford Coppola 2.0. He goes, he had a locked, colored, mixed show and something was bothering him and he said I'm going in and fixing it right. and I just want to say though so everybody hears it and we'll talk about it more on a ramble on but you know yes I'm obsessive and will not stop but that we had Ted because I'll be honest with you I'm tapped out for money not that I'm broke nobody needs right. to cry for me I said I was going to put up a certain amount of money to make yeah, the yeah, show listen, you, and it's, putting your own money into anything is a risky but problem. Ted did not even did not. My son is calling in the middle of the podcast. 
Ted did not miss a freaking beat right. to uh, to go. We have to continue on well, until this is the best. Ted, that Ted's be. a businessman. He's hedging his bets, and 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 we made uh, we made great strides. But so. there's also businessmen that go. I'm cutting my losses, but he believes in this, and right. and we are now now we're. 48 hours away from anyone who wants to see this. And I don't mean the general public, anyone right. who wants to buy this thing is able to see right. it and we're ready to go. Yeah. You just got, you, it's time to, to let it fly. So we'll see. And now when we, we're going to take a break and we come back, we're coming back. But with, we're not going to give accolades of David Nutter first. We're going to no, say I, in front of him no, and embarrass I should, him. Like I, no, fucking, I think we should say call him, him like, you know, we're going to, we're going to say in front of him. We're going to wait. We're going to bring on David Nutter, director, extraordinaire legend after the break all right welcome back victory the podcast one of our favorite directors who was very instrumental in helping us on entourage did a lot of episodes but has done 10 episodes of, 10 episodes kind of did a lot of research he, he, he's mad that i do research on the guests he wants <laughs> my research he, he can't have it <laughs> but david has done you know some of the greatest shows in television history from Sopranos. We can talk about all of them, but Sopranos and uh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Homeland. And, and also, David, you know, when we got you on Entourage, you were already known as this guy who gets every pilot that you do picked up, which is for anyone listening out there who doesn't understand this, when you do a pilot, you want to get picked up desperately. Most of them do not. Statistically speaking, most pilots do not go. But statistically speaking, David Nutter's usually did go. So, and it was hey, called, his nickname was the Pilot Whisperer. Is that true, Six. David? Have you ever heard that? Yeah, it's actually I've heard that before, and I, I did about sixteen in a row. Sixteen this, in a row. Yeah, but this is when they had like four channels. Right. You know, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and the WB. Yeah. Yeah. So, so sixteen pilots in a row to get picked up. I mean, that's kind of like being an undefeated, an undefeated boxer. Like at a certain point. It's going to come, but 16 yeah. in a row is a good run. Yeah, but I ended up at 20 for 23. 20 for 23. That is Hall sick. of Fame numbers. And by the way, just so, you know, for people who like to count count money, when you direct a pilot, for anyone who's <laughs> hoping to get into this business, if you never work on the show again, if you directed that pilot, you get a certain amount of money every single episode that airs. So 20 television shows on the air. David yep. could be sitting in the Bahamas Collecting checks. So. And, all, and also the good thing is, once you have success, they give you a little back end. The, oh. oh, there you go, Doug. The word, you want uh, back end, Kyle. So he won, word. David, you won a, an Emmy for Band of Brothers, yes. right? That was a, what was that shoot like? Uh, Band of Brothers was, uh, it was life-changing. It was a situation in which it was the first time that I think that we as a society really wanted to take World War II seriously and kind of say, let's make this history for people. Let's make this a show that people can watch and say, this is what really happened. So this, of course, was about the uh, the uh, uh, landing in Normandy, and of course, all throughout the uh, going out to to Hitler's eagle's nest and 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 ending the war there. But it was just it was incredible. It was, it was huge budget, huge size, and we they just didn't save Private Ryan, so it was kind of a lot of that vibe to it as well. But it was life changing. It was just so ex much fun and, and and special. And I remember one of my days we were finishing shooting, and I turned to everybody and said, "Guys, we have a responsibility." To tell this the way it happened, right? And, and and you guys have done a great job. And what did you make? Because we we've spoken a lot because of Dylan and Platoon. We've spoken a lot about Captain Dale Dye, who trains actors to yeah. be soldiers. Yeah. What what? Because I, I I did a pilot that didn't get picked up with with Captain Dye. Um, what what kind of affected? How was that working with sort of a guy that's training the actors to do one thing, and you're sort of focused on the storytelling part and he's on the, on the soldier part did you because he was pretty big presence on, on the set right well, yeah he and was David a big as presence. close as you can be to that Mike. he was a big presence but the most important thing i think is to really get him on your side and let him know that you're serious about this let him know you know what you're doing so it's it, so what, it's interesting i am um, uh, Came in and I, it was a situation in which I, I, I had the whole setup of the town. I said, I was saying these guys should come in from here. These guys have to come from here. I had, I had a whole game plan. And he was like, he's serious about this as far as the, the, the military is concerned. So from then on, it was fantastic with him. He was very supportive. Wow. It's kind of like when um, I had to meet An Andrew Dice Clay <laughs> for you guys, which was, was a lot of fun. <laughs> David very Nutter, David Nutter directed the finale of Entourage, right? Didn't Yes. You did. Yeah, David did the finale yeah. on yeah. the hangar and oh, yeah. going back to California. It's Look at Doug. He doesn't oh, yeah. even remember. It's really sad that I don't remember. I mean, the biggest yeah. the biggest episode I remember where David was, because we were 
we were so complicated. It was the Christina Aguilera thing, oh, and yeah. we had a song going, and I was like, thank God David's doing this, because David is, which I want to talk a little bit about your process. We've talked about how I direct, which I'm, I'm much more of a words guy, and you come in, and you have every moment kind of... And I don't know if you do this with all shows. I'd like to hear, because I'm assuming Entourage for you is like a fucking walk in the park oh, compared no. to showing no, up no, no, on no, Game no, of no. Thrones. Not at all. Tell, tell me what the difference is that, because I remember that day, your timing of the music and the this, everything was so precise and you knew exactly what needed to happen. And so how, how do you prepare differently for a show like Entourage, which is more of a dialogue show, even though we try to make it as visual as possible. And a show like Game of Thrones, where you're, you know, doing crazy shit with ama amazing amounts of extras. Well, I, I think it, I think I kind of treated very much the same way each project. The thing about Entourage that really, I was frightened as hell when I got this job. Uh, I, I met Gary Goldman, and Gary Goldman helped to kind of walk me through the whole world. He kind of was responsible for me getting in the field, because I kept saying to myself, how do they do this? It's so real. So, so they're in the game. They're in the, they're in the middle of the whole, whole deal. And how does it really? How, how do they do that? And I was I was just mesmerized by the, that ability that you guys had created. And he told me, and we talked more, and we kind of got into it. And I kind of then just kind of played with that. And so what I did was I knew not to be too um, hit marks that hit, that hit marks and all that kind of stuff like that. But if I could kind of hurl them in a certain area and let that kind of play out. These guys are just, of course, were magic and did it all themselves. I think it's really funny because David says, when I got that job, I actually remember, <laughs> however it came to us, whether it was Gary, I'm like, can you, can you get him to do it, an episode for us? Like, it was not you getting the job like you, <laughs> like you interviewed and, and we had approved. Like, and, and, you know, you were, again, like, when you're on a set, there's different types of directors. David, you just feel like... You're going to make your day. He knows exactly where he's at at all times. And obviously, I, the way I look at it, I went to film school, but that's instinctual as opposed to training. So, But where does your training come from and where did all that kind of start? Um, well, uh, well, one thing I'll say to you is when it comes to being on the set, every second of that day counts. So the key is to try to keep it moving. And I think the crew likes it. I sometimes will have them do have more shots than normally, but I think they like the direction of things, know where things are headed. So I think that where that started was, it all started back when I wanted to be Barry Manilow. What? Yep, I wanted to be the next Barry Manilow. This? No, yeah, I, was this? A voice, I was a voice major in college, and I wanted to be, yeah, be the next Barry Manilow because I sang all the love songs to the girls in high school, <laughs> and the quarterback had nothing on me. <laughs> uh, but um, So I got to college, and I realized I wasn't going to be the next Barry Manilow, so I said to myself, what do I do? How can I... How can I move people and, and get them get give them to feel emotion and touch them. So I took a Super 8 film class and maybe I was going to write, write movies for movies, but I wasn't good enough for that. But the Super 8 film class was to roll up your sleeves and go do it. So at that point, I kind of just kind of fell into that kind of attitude and kind of always knew that the organization was everything. Where did you go to school? I went to the University of Miami, and it was kind of a film school in which uh, it was a learn-by-doing school in which I had uh, two very hip professors, and it was kind of a situation where they had gotten all the CP16 cameras from the news channels because they all went to video. So we had a lot of equipment, a lot of stuff, so we would kind of go fall on your ass, make a mistake, and come and do it again. And that was, that was, that was fun. That's Doug, you didn't know that fun. Barry Manilow was like a major influence on No, I had no idea. If you, if you watch uh, Game of Thrones, the uh, final documentary. Barry Manilow it, was in it? No. They, yeah. they, they <laughs> did it. Yo, they, Game of Thrones. They did, you know, Game of Thrones, could it be magic? Which piece? song? They did it. Could it be magic? They did, you know, a, they the, did the a tribute. Oh, they, did a, they did a tribute to Nutter yeah. when they played the Barry Manilow song. Zula, I looked over, Zulai's crying. Zulai's so crying. Movie, was it's super emotional. I believe. Yeah. I mean, the beginning, it could be magic. I, I could be wrong. Is that Rock Rock and yeah, off? Sure, it is, yeah, right? Yeah. Chopin. So yeah. I mean, weirdly enough, just a side. I love Barry Manilow. Story. So the first record I ever bought, there was a song called Magic, yeah. and my father took me to the to the record store to get the song. And and if you know the song, and we went, and I said, "Get me the Magic song." And we came home, and it was the Barry Manilow song, not the song I wanted. Could it be magic? And and, <laughs> and then. Uh, um, I also, which, you know, some young people might be listening to this, I love Barry Manilow and saw Barry Manilow in concerts, one of my first concerts in uh, Campania. But so did you play piano? Did you? Yeah, I played piano a little bit for myself and sang and wrote songs and stuff. And not to, to, to go off on Barry Manilow uh, thing. <laughs> I but, just you think know, it's awesome. But That's the Clive so Davis doc, it was kind of like Barry Manilow when I was growing up was, I thought was this beyond genius guy, which he still is. Oh, yeah. But he didn't write 
most of the stuff, yeah. and and really kind of Clive Davis, right? Like kind of like. Well, he but, came in and did that as well. But I, you know, it was a situation one night. I remember, I remember um, sitting in my bed and laying my head, and the radio comes on, and Barry Manilow's version of uh, "I Write the Songs" mm-hmm. comes on. And, I write the, the songs yeah. that make the whole yeah, yeah. world sing. And uh, don't, don't I just went, I, mean, oh, I was taken. I was, I was totally gone. <laughs> I love Barry. I yeah. mean, he was, what was it in a Foul Play, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it was a which, great, song. great movie, Chevy Chase, Ready Goldie Hawn. chance again. Yeah. Yep, yep. So, so, well, listen, so Game of Thrones, Homeland, The Sopranos. <laughs> that checks pretty much every box for me. What was Sopranos like? Uh, what I found out about Sopranos was this. They're, everyone was so devoted to David Chase's vision. Right. And there was a sense of fear on the set a little bit because of that and understanding that. Hmm. And, but, you know, every time I sat down with them and talked to these guys, they were all very great to the point, gave me real matter of fact answers about things. And my thing was just trying to keep up. And, and also, I wanted to realize that even James Daniel Feeney wants to be directed. Right. You know, and a lot of directors can't, you know, kind of don't go up to the stars and say, well, blah, 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 something. But as long as I did my homework and talked about stuff, that was good. Uh, and the other good thing about the Sopranos situation was um, James Gianfini was in a coma. So, uh, <laughs> and, and he's very, very method, or was, of course, very method. And he, so he was in a coma. So in the coma scenes, he stayed up all night and slept all day in the bed. So at times I had to stop him from snoring. I had to knock him, move him a little bit from snoring. <laughs> and then the character he plays was a really good guy selling a, a, a sunroof, a, a sun panels for solar energy in a, new, a guy from New Jersey in Orange County. And he was playing this real normal guy. So I directed the normal Tony Soprano. Not, oh, that's not, right. Not the killer guy. When he had the alter ego. That was, yes. oh, interesting. Yeah, David Chase said that was his number one episode. That's oh, really, well, well really I... Any fear on the entourage set that I, I we, was there any of that? Yeah, oh, he was terrified well, it, of you. It, 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 <laughs> my only fear was to do a great job. Yeah, well, you, well, you did for sure. Because you, you guys were so, so everything you did was great. I think all the stuff that, that Mark Mylod and uh, Julian Farina. Julian Farina. guys started up with the look and done jail was just brilliant. So uh, how does a guy like, and, and, and I, I'm not even being funny. I, I got to work with Imperioli on, uh, he did a pilot right. with me and one of the great actors I've ever worked yeah. with. Yeah. But Gandolfini and Edie Falco, who um, probably you could argue two of the best to ever do it as yeah. a, as a husband and wife couple on TV. I, I right? mean, I, I can't think of, of a better. They're definitely up there. So when you're walking on that set for the first time, which you started, what did you start in season one? No, no, no. This yeah, is like three, season three, three, four. four so five. you're coming onto this show, which already is like this iconic thing. How is that tough to walk up to? Actually, I know on our set because our set was so relaxed and so casual, and everybody's kind of just regular Joes. Is there any fear walking up to Gandolfini and Edie, Edie Falco, or did they just welcome you in? And Well, no, I think, I think they're very uh, uh, guarded, mm-hmm. which is important. So the, the main thing is, I think, it's just to kind of you know, talk to them and not, not bullshit with them and just talk normal stuff and let them know that I'll, you know, if there's something... That, but whatever, and and not not uh, pick at little things and so forth, because that's a new thing. Because that's what they're so wonderful at. So, but it was also a situation where I wanted them to know that I was there for them, right? Because there's so much going on. It's like uh, you know, it's like a, it's you, you can't you can't really deal, you can't really pinpoint what that's all about. But it was interesting. One thing I did was at the end of the production meeting, and everyone's very silent, and quiet during the production meeting. I stopped and I said, David, I just want to let you know you're a very fortunate man. This crew is uh, behind you 1,000%, and I've never been on a crew that was so uh, dedicated to, to really p- portray your vision of a show. And there was silence. <laughs> <laughs> he just doesn't give you anything back. Oh, no, no. Yeah, yeah. That's no, so no. strange. It very, it very it's just the way he is, apparently, right? I mean, yeah. it's like... He just seems... And again, I lo- he's a genius, but he, oh, seems, genius. he seems angry. <laughs> but so... As opposed to it, you? It's it interesting. He'd always call me the maestro. Uh, I don't know why, but... Well, that's, there you go. That's nice. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I have a question, and this is... I would ask this question of you, too, Doug, right? So, David, you do so many shows, okay? So when you're going into a show that's existing... How many episodes do you have to watch of the show? I mean, obviously, if you're going on to Homeland or popping onto one of these shows, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to sit and watch the previous 
whatever episodes. You're not going to watch every episode of the show. So how do you familiarize with this, yourself with a show that's been running for a minute so you can actually speak intelligently to the characters and sort of what's happening, right? Is there like a cheat oh, yeah. sheet kind yeah. of vibe? No cheat sheet. It's, it's interesting when you say that. Uh, my son was to, to a uh, year off, to a gap year, and he was working for me as an assistant on Shameless. And so I had him watch six seasons of Shameless in like three weeks. <laughs> and for an 18-year-old kid, that's a pretty rough show to watch. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on there. <laughs> and, and, but, but, but to me, it's a situation which I got I to gotta watch enough shows to really get me a sense of feeling who the characters are. Right. And that's, that's everything. That's vital. So when I did my first DR, that was like, how the fuck do I do that? Right. So that was really important to, to keep that going. And That's, is it true that you did a 21 Jump Street? Oh, yeah, that was my first job. How about that? He did, directed well, 11 well, what's, what's, in, what's interesting about that is they did a low-budget movie in, in Miami called Cease Fire with Don Johnson. Then they <laughs> then went to that movie in Miami. Then they hired him to become Sonny Crockett. So then I came to Los Angeles and couldn't get arrested directing traffic. And, uh, and the movie got a lot of great reviews and so forth. And couldn't get arrested directing traffic. So I, I used to play golf when I was in junior high school. So I'm a director in Los Angeles, in Hollywood. I got a director, right? I can't do anything else. So I spent a lot of time on the golf course. So basically, I went out one day on a Sunday with two guys, and somebody happened to join us on, 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 the, on the golf course, and it was Patrick Hasberg. And Patrick Hasberg had just created Hardcastle and McCormick, and he also just created his new show called 20 on Jump Street. So he, we started talking, and I was kind of this, I was bitter at this point, didn't think <laughs> anything was going to come up and so forth. He started talking to me, and I found out that he was a ski instructor to Michael Eisner, Steve Candle, and Michael Ovitz in Aspen. And Stephen Candle took him under his wing because his son died, and he was a good writer. And so he came out to Los Angeles and became the Hard Castle McCormick. But we played 18 holes of golf. He asked me all these questions, and we, went, we sat and had a beer, and he said, well, you know, um, let's, um, let's, uh, you're going to hear from me tomorrow. So... He went to call Steve Beers, his production uh, guy, and said, uh, Steve, I want you to uh, hire Dave Nutter to direct an episode in the spring. And he goes, well, okay, I'll look at his movie. We'll talk about it. He goes, no, hire him. Hmm. Well, Patrick Casper also, also uh, was the first guy to hire Brad Pitt, was the first guy to hire Johnny Depp, <laughs> was the first guy to hire George, early George Clooney on a motorcycle gang. I, I shot with him. I directed him an episode of that. But... Um, that's amazing. Amazing. I, play amazing. Golf, I play golf two days a week, and nobody does a fucking thing for me out there. <laughs> I know. But I'm Jesus telling you, it, 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 I, I write every golf game off, too. So I don't play the wrong still, golf course. I still, no, but, I still write the golf games off. But it is, fucking like bullshit, I said, man. when you see how David operates. He must set, have said something. He said something. I'm but saying the wrong shit on the off, golf course. That's uh, what I'm doing. It, it, off the topic, since we're talking 35 fucking years ago, yeah. but Johnny Depp, who I think it was... Pretty pretty famous story that he just became a giant movie star while that show was happening and just said, get me off of this show. But A, what was he like or to work agents. with then? And B, are you watching this trial at all, which is just insane? Well, uh, I have to tell you a couple points of that. Interesting. But Johnny Depp, uh, I worked with him up in Vancouver, of course, in the show. I fortunately did an episode where Am Amnesty International was involved and Delaware, Peter Delaware's character falls in love with a girl from Nicaragua who's, who's on the run from, from the immigration department. So Peter marries her to try to keep her in the country, and it doesn't work out. So what happens is that she gets sent back away. And we had uh, you two, uh, Peter, Sting gave us music for that uh, oh, wow. episode, wow. and Peter Gabriel did a PSA at the end of the episode. For 21 Jump Street. Yeah, so then, Jesus. so we won an Im image award for that. And then, and then the when the next episode came, came about, when... Um, uh, they went to Miami. They followed some kid to Miami uh, on an on overnight bus to Miami for spring break and gets sucked down there, and the episode happens. And after the episode, they're at the beach, and Johnny Depp says, let's go down and try to find her. So then that episode take, took place in Nicaragua, and I directed that, and basically you 2 gave us some music, and Bono did a PSA at the end. Jesus. Which is fantastic. And Johnny Depp was dying to get off of the now, show. I, I, and this yeah. was the time where Johnny was dying to get off the show. This is the time where he was, he and Renona were really, were really together, very, very tight, and he, he was getting tired of the, of the series, and he did a lot of things with hair on his face. And it was a situation which... <laughs> a lot of things with his hair on his face. Bruce didn't like that. He didn't have to do that. So then one night came up, it was a very important evening because it was a really great scene about, about um, loss and, and um, this girl dying and a really pro, a pro Amnesty International storyline. I just talked to him about it. Five minutes later, he came out with a band on, hair back, and did the scene beautifully. 
But um, this th- Johnny Depp's a great guy. He's always been a great guy. Um, I actually directed a pilot in in Austin, Texas called Jack and Bobby, and and uh, Amber Heard had a small role in the show. I remember I Jack and Bobby. Was, I, I loved it. Yeah, she how, had a very how, small role in the pilot. How was she? And she was yeah, a very small role in the pilot, but I thought she was fascinating. I thought she was great. And I said, come out to L.A. and I'll get you an agent. I'll get you an agent. So I, she came out to Los Angeles. I hooked up with an agent at, uh, at William Morris Endeavor, of course, Endeavor in the day. And then she hooked her up with Joan Heiler, the big manager who handles all the big stars in Charlotte Shirley Cerrone. And Amber just so you're essentially there. responsible for this whole trial yes, that America. It's, it's, my, it's my fault. Exactly. So when you're when you're working with Johnny Depp, who's at that point 21, 22 yeah. years old, are you like this guy's a movie star? I, I mean, I've got someone. Did you know? Did you feel that or what? Absolutely. Yeah, I felt that just immediately. Did you feel that with Connolly at all? Or no? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, though. Do you think, and, and I know that it, it became a thing for Clooney as well. Clooney finished out his contract. Do you blame a guy or a gal who who is now getting these other opportunities and wants to explore them? Do they, you know, I mean, I, and, and believe me, it's probably more than just Johnny that wants him off the show at that point. It's probably his agents. It's probably a bunch of people. So wh- I do. What do you <laughs> you you think the Clooney route? Finish out your contract that you signed. I, I and think when it. you agree to a contract. You finish it out. We know on a show how many people are being employed that's by that true. show, Fair and enough. who may not, who may not have another job after that. I mean, I haven't worked since Entourage, so right. if one of you bailed out on me, I would have been uh, unemployed then. So I think, yeah, I think you finish out your contract, and if you're going to be a movie star, you'll be a movie star three years later. Now that being said, we all know Tom Selleck was unable to do Raiders of the Lost Ark because he was stuck on Magnum PI, and maybe he would. I mean, he still. Has a good career, but yeah, maybe you would have been right. I, no, listen, there's there's lots of examples yeah. of that. I mean, uh, you know, Hugh Jackman uh, wasn't the original Wolverine. I mean, there, there's yeah. endless, there's yeah. endless. Uh, so, here's here's one thing yeah. I, I wanted to wanted to ask about. So, for people listening, you, with episodic t- TV directing, a lot of times they're they're kind of put together. So it'll be David Nutter is going to do episode one and two. Mark Mylod is going to do episodes three and four. And then David Nutter is going to do five and six. So you kind of alternate. And that's sort of your prepping while the other one's shooting. And that's kind of how you run through a season, yeah. right? Nowadays, there are directors, and I'm, I think you might be here, which is why I wanted to ask you this. Now, they're taking these full seasons and having one director do it. I mean, if you look at Big Little Lies, Jean Marc Vallet, I mean, rest in peace, did Big Little Lies, right? He did right. all those episodes. Right. That's a big, that is a, that is a tall order that you're talking about 10 hours of television. You're talking about a 10 hour movie. Is that something that you're doing currently or you're, you're considering doing? How do you feel about that as opposed to two episodes here, an episode here, as opposed to doing all of them? Uh, well, I think that, um, I finally got a script that I've been wanting to make all my life. I said, uh, I said to the writer, I said, you know, this screenplay is something I've loved all my life, even before I read it. I just was in love with the promise of that of that script. Just somehow, something hit me. And I'm a big schmaltzy guy, and I love romantic stuff. And a smart, smart, smart repartee, as Doug is so well versed at. Thanks. But it was a situation which I had to do it, so I stayed and did six episodes. And we shot 10-hour days. What was did this? responsibly, and go ahead. What is that? What, what show are you oh, talking oh, about? Oh, sorry. Time Traveler's Wife. Oh, okay. Thank you. On HBO now. It's on HBO right now. It's on HBO right now. They just did the second episode uh, Sunday oh, night. Oh, I'm excited. So you I'm did all of them. them. I directed them Jesus Christ, that's yeah. a lot. So wait, so it's a six-episode first season, or that's yes, the end of it? Yes, six-episode first season. Okay, I, so all right, so I'm going to watch crossed. that tonight. Time Traveler's Wife on yeah. HBO. Yeah, okay. it's, definitely, it's definitely worth watching, for sure. Yeah. It, it's something that'll get you hooked, and every episode gets better. But to go back real quickly about the contract, one secret that I had is that I had a secret of Vancouver. When I did Smallville in Vancouver, you know, Tom, Tom, was up, Tom was up there getting started and so forth. He lives in Vancouver. That was his thing. That show lasted 10 years. Then um, uh, Stephen Rennell went up there and did Arrow. He saw met Tom and so forth. They became friends and so forth. He was up there for eight years. Between Smallville and Arrow was Supernatural. Those guys are buddies. They all kind of lived together in the whole kind of world. They were there for 15 years. Jeez. And Grant Gustin ended up there for eight years for Flash. So take the show to Vancouver and say, you'll keep your actors. Because what happens when they're in Los Angeles, the managers are with them all day and saying, 
they're scared as the actors are going to leave them. So they're saying, oh, these producers suck. They don't even care about you. I know it's good for you. Da, da, da. So I think it's good. But to also, just they lock I'm, them away. In a, in also, exactly, exactly. That's what I did. But also, I'm not suggesting that uh, you have to do 15 years on a TV show. I'm just saying you fill, if you sign your initial well, that's contract, you, you fill it out. Yeah. And once it's done, if yeah, you, exactly. you, you want to leave, you leave. But I, the most interesting question about your career to me is every – Television episodic directors, um, it's a it's a tough gig. You're coming into somebody else's yeah. show every week. There is a bunch of egos, and you're trying to fill in with a new family. And really, most people, why they do that is because they want to get to become a pilot director. Right. Because a pilot director is as close to a film director as you're going to get. Yeah. You have just a giant, enormous influence on that show. You, who is one of the most successful pilot directors in the history of the business. Pilot Whisperer. Yeah. Why is it that you just love directing? Why do you love going on to, to doing so many episodic TVs when it's clearly not about the money? What, what, what about that process is it for you? Well, for, for me, it was a situation in which the first pilot that I directed, um, I was going to stay on producer and direct. But um, there was some contractual thing happened, and I couldn't do it. So I said, well... A, a broken heart and I can't stay on the series but I'll go back to X-Files and I directed four great episodes of X-Files <laughs> the X-Files Ty Bruckman. it's crazy and then I did another pilot that didn't go it went for a couple episodes but at that point I just decided not to do stay on pilots and just do the pilot and leave one year I did the Roswell pilot I love this show I love the work with Jason Kadams and we talked about doing a certain situation how we would do this creatively together and it didn't really work out that well so Jim Cameron called and got me. I, uh, they said I could do Dark Angel, so I went and did that pilot. Jesus. So I kind of stayed. <laughs> over, and, but what I've done is I, I do the pilots in the first half of the season. Then the second half of the season, I go to a show I, tr- I wanted to hopefully be on. Right. Entourage was the case. West Wing was the case. Band of Brothers, the Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, really just you ER. love being on a set and directing. Yeah, but but I don't work. I never work that much. As I've worked now in these six episodes. That's what. That's my point. Like the, yeah. the idea of doing six. I mean, think it's a six-hour movie. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's just mind-boggling amount of work. I'm, I'm excited to, to to see it now and just explain so anyone listening can understand. When you're in making a movie, the director, besides obviously the producer studio, always they're the heads, but. Doing a pilot is pro, or, or, or doing all six episodes is probably the next best thing. So, how much creative freedom did you have on that show? How much did you work with the writer? And how much is the studio on your back when you've done so much in your career? Well, the good thing with HBO was that uh, they liked the script so much, but they were worried about the script, how things would be handled, how this would be directed, how this would be dealt with. And, and um, Stephen Moffat is just so brilliant. Uh, he's from England, of course, and what happened is the fact that this is all during COVID, so they couldn't come over to the States very often, or hardly at all. But what was important to me that I wanted to make sure that I got them as much stuff as possible and scenes as possible. And they, they saw stuff and saw what we were doing in production, pre-production. And they, he seemed to be quite good about everything. Very, very smart, very smart and very giving. And I made sure I went over everything with him. Everything with him. The key was to make sure that there's a communication. It has to be a communication. You can't, like, say one thing and do the other or something like that. Because to me, the script is the Bible. And as a director, I don't want to bring my influence in this show. I want the script to be to be seen and you don't notice me. I don't want to be noticed I'm directing. I don't want to be thought about or talked about. Right. I want to be basically the story does that. So that's a very important thing for me to do that. And on this show is basically, Stephen was very nervous because there's lots of, lots of comedy beats in it as well. And there's one big important scene in episode four that there's lots of doors and ins and outs and positions and so forth. And he kept worrying about that sequence. And so I basically put together a, a diagram for me, and I showed him how I would do it. Then I basically shot it with the actors and did a rehearsal with it and cut it together. And once he saw it, once he saw the scene, he was like, I'm good. That's awesome. Right. And what was really nice is that this was not a sh- situation where we'd show him a cut of the show, and he'd be like, pick pointing this and that and this and that. He was very smart about the cuts we made and, and very together about all that stuff, and it was, it was just a real true pleasure. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I can't wait to watch it tonight. And Obviously, Game of Thrones is... You know, one of people's favorite shows of all time. It's awesome. But real quick, because I want to talk a good chunk of Game of Thrones. But before we get into Game of Thrones, what any Homeland anecdotes? Because I we need 
good minute for Game of Thrones. But uh, what was Homeland like? Manny Patinkin, serious, no, Alex very Ganza serious. was on Entourage for a minute. Serious actor, yeah. creator of uh, Homeland. serious actor. What and, and and Claire Danes is awesome. That Homeland's one of my favorite shows. It's up there on the list with you know Game of Thrones and and The Wire and whatnot. So what what was what was Homeland like? At what point did you join that show? Yeah, I, was, I came there when they were shooting in North Carolina before they went off to, to, to Berlin and uh, South Africa and all that kind of stuff. But the most, uh, the interesting thing for me was that Claire was very, uh, Claire was great. You know, making material people when I met him in prep and so forth. I, they kind of pushed past along. I was a good guy and all that stuff. And um, uh, Leslie Link Ladder was running the show. She was fantastic, of course, to work with. And um, but Manny Patankin. Yeah. He's got heard the stories about, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I have Manny Patankin albums. I'm a Manny Patankin fanatic. <laughs> I went to see Sunday in the Park with George, the 25th year anniversary, and they performed it at the libretto. Right. I basically said, Manny Patankin, I love you. <laughs> right. So, when he, and he, when he saw that I was really into his, his uh, Broadway career and all that stuff, Right, smooth, smooth talking. He knew that you knew what he was and Why, what he was. Is Mandy allegedly difficult? No, no, he's uh, serious. A long, time, a long time ago, it was like Chicago Hope days. That was the thing. But well, uh, didn't he, he walk off? Didn't he quit Criminal Minds at twenty five no million? Yeah, he, did, he, he just did, walked he did, off. He, did, he yeah, said, yeah. "I'm done with this show." He's yeah. making like a gazillion dollars a year. He just walked off the show. Yeah, it's yeah, crazy. Yeah. He's about passion, right? right. He's all about passion. <laughs> That's interesting. All right, Game of Thrones. This is this is the big. Yeah, one. So, I mean, How do you do that? Probably, the, probably the, <laughs> one of the most expensive shows in the history of TV. Right. How how much prep? Like Entourage, you're coming on probably. Two weeks prep, maybe? Less? Oh, yeah, yeah. How, so, how much prep is there for Game of Thrones episode? Well, hmm. Uh, a lot of times it used to be a situation where and I did the first, I did four, four of the seasons, and it was a situation which we go to basically different locations because the show's shooting in different locations. So you shoot your block in, in Ireland or shoot your block in Spain. Wow. And then go, uh, or go to Iceland, shoot your block, and go to um, Africa, and shoot your block, or go to Croatia, and shoot your block. So it's all kind of pieced together. The last season of the eight, eight episodes, I directed three of the eight. That season, they said, okay, David, we're going to start rolling on October 9th. You're going to be the director until December 22nd, every day. Wow. So I like, created like a movie. So I had to do a six-hour little movie for that. But what was, what was really great is that my episodes in season eight were really the episodes that kind of got to know the characters more. Story episodes. Yeah, that, them, the episodes we introduced characters in one. The second episode, they're all waiting for the big battle. Fourth episode, big out battles over, and now what's the next thing's going to happen? Right. And the departures and so forth, and and that. And so, what excites you more, and maybe both equally? Big battle sequence? Do you go? Oh, I just can't wait to get into this. the scope of or, the size. Or, oh, I want to sit with these two people at a table and learn stuff that nobody's. Listen to in, Vince and E. Chap hack up <laughs> Doug's script, or watch dragons get slain. Because I honestly, I, if you told me that, like, <laughs> if you gave me a hundred million dollars and said go direct a Game of Thrones would episode, go, I, I wouldn't even no know idea. where to. I, I agree. Call I'm David Nutter. I would you. go. I'm with I need you. help. Well, I think it's interesting. I am. Um, when I did the Pacific, which is a episode a series, they did twenty twenty seven million dollars an episode. Jesus, they spent on <laughs> because what happened was that uh, Band of Brothers has been the highest selling DVD in in the world every Christmas because your kids give it to their parents. And all that kind of yeah, stuff. so there's always a little check in the mail for me for that, which Love is always nice. But um, with um, the Pacific, I directed an episode, and another episode was coming up, and it's right around the Writers Guild strike. And so a lot of things are kind of feeling out what's going to happen. And so Peter Roth wanted me to direct Fringe, the pilot for Fringe, and come back to the States knew that. And Fringe was like a, not a strong version of X-Files. And I said, well, you know, Peter, I had a meeting with this writer and read the teaser of his pilot, and I think this one could really be special. And that was The Mentalist. And, uh, Jesus. Uh, and so he let me go with that. So what You're a loser, was, Doug. So they said, what are you going to do? Yeah, you, uh, they want me to do this new with Jim. So I said, here's what I can do. I can spend... Let me shoot the Iwo Jima part, the action part, the scene. And then, uh, of course, Jeremy Pedazzo directed all the other sequences and, and him coming home and so forth, the character John Basselman, played by John Seda. And so that was fun. That was like 12 days of go and do it. Because ba I was basically shooting Iwo Jima, and there was no beach. We had basically HBO would kind of come in and, and brought in a million dollars worth of, of black <laughs> sand and so forth, came in and <laughs> dug out this whole deal. And... Um, and I created it with you with that. That was that was probably the most exciting battle sequence. How many seen. cameras are you are you shooting on a on a big battle sequence like that? Um, you know, sometimes four or five, and Jeez. sometimes you have stationary cameras as well. And then probably the most the most daunting action sequence I ever shot was 
the one in um, Game of Thrones where it was episode 509 and they're having the big um, the big uh, uh, festivities where Danny is with the, with the, with the new uh, group she's with us. I've forgotten their name. <laughs> and, the dra- and, and there becomes a riot in the big stadium and then the dragon comes in and flies in and saves her. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, yeah. God. That was a lot of stuff. That was a situation. <laughs> a and, do, and, do, and doing that, that's the deal with that. I would sit down with each actor and kind of get them to talk through it and be interested in what we're going to do. And then also do, it's all like offense, defense, football kind of thing. It's like, these guys, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, and just get everybody and kind of involved in it that way. So a little more complicated than Piven and Christina much, Aguilera much. <laughs> having a little chat. And what is it? What are you actually looking at when the dragon, What, what what's the eye line for the dragon? Because we know it's not a really green the ball. dragon there. It's a giant green ball? A green ball, yeah. And are you, ball. How again, big is the green ball? You should, uh, let me put it this way. You should, uh, you should hear me on a set. I'll go, <laughs> I would <laughs> love to see that. Because honestly, I've never done anything the even remotely is a close green to ball? that. So I can't even imagine. Everything I've ever done is so grounded and realistic. I can't imagine being like, all right, Collie, the dragon's coming at you. So are you like, because, I mean, you were And here comes the dragon. Set, but, uh, <laughs> it has to be. Yeah. You have to, you have to, keep, you have to keep, people, keep people in it. Yeah, you have to be. You have to basically sometimes sound like the biggest fool on the set, and sometimes not. Right. But you have to. You have to get people to be all reacting to the same thing, and that was very important. Re- remember, you guys. David well, directed. Here's a little. Story. Gary Goldman. Gary Goldman chiming in. Yeah, please. What's he yelling Gary about? Goldman. Remember, I, I can't David, hear David directed the most popular Game of Thrones ever with the most popular scene, the Red Wedding. The Red Wedding. You directed God. the Red Wedding scene. Yeah. Yes. Oh. I mean, not that. I, I hate to like get. Your, dire- your directing is great in everything, but that obviously is one of the most memorable moments. Well, people Whether refer it- to it like it's like the Red Wedding, right? Yeah. Like I when I did something that's like, yeah, we think Red Wedding. Like it's become like almost like a reference point for oh, a yeah. scene. Yeah. And I obviously like to talk one thing. I, I, I My belief is the best script is going to be the best episode, but when you get a script and, and you tell me, is there any time some people, which... Game of Thrones is one of my favorite shows of all time. Some people had problems with season eight. Yes. Now, it's definitely a little different. I think the book was over. Have you come on to a show that you love and gotten a script that you don't love for getting Game of Thrones? But are you like, oh, I didn't get the best episode. What can I do to to make this better? Or do you work with the writer? And, and how do you do that? Uh, well, I, I did a show once, um, and it was a, an episode of uh, Lost in Space. And uh, this is about a time where I had some back surgery, and I was out, out of the, out, not working for a while. And um, I uh, came back, and I got this Lost in Space, and I worked out the deal with this with the director who ended up being fired off the show. Uh, so I came in, and they gave me the last episode of the season. So it's like, okay, here's the deal. And they start talking about uh, the character uh, 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 of uh, Will Robinson. And this wonderful actor, who Gary, you have to give me his name quickly because I have to say it out loud because he's so wonderful. This young kid who played the uh, uh, Will Robinson character. Now, when I was younger, Billy Mummy was my hero, the original Lost in Space series. He was the man. You know, I grew up without a dad, and this kid was the man. He he always had the courage to do this and that kind of stuff. And the thing with this, this the young kid was this actor who Gary's going to give me his name. Um, he was very emotionally driven. So he was in a situation where he could cry on a dime. He'd even come into, come into a um, scene with me and say, oh, I'll cry here and cry here and all that kind of stuff. And I basically, the first thing, I, this, and this is the episode in which his character steps up and saves the family. So basically I just started off with this. I said, first of all, we're not going to do any of that shit. I believe in talking to young people like you're talking to an adult. Sometimes you're talking to adults like you're talking to a young person. And with young people, I say, always talk to them like an adult. And so I said, you're not going to do that anymore. You're Will Robinson, and you're the hero. You're the tough guy. We're not going to cry here. There's going to be a situation with a big scene at the very end where the robot kind of has gone haywire, and he doesn't know if he recognizes him or not. And Don't you remember me? I'm Will Robinson. I said, no. You're going to be Batman. You're going to walk up to him and say, I'm Will Robinson. And this kid was so great. He was so incredible that he had that other part of him, that other side of him, that he could explore that stuff. And you got the name, Gary? Max Jenkins. Max Jenkins. Such an, he's such an amazing actor. He ended up getting six foot tall too very quickly. But, <laughs> but what happened was Don't, the fact that... I was upset. What, what, what happened was the fact that this guy, um, he, he did this amazingly, and he's kept in touch with me ever since. He really felt that I was the one director that kind of pulled him out of 
that child acting. Right. And that was that was that was very important. And that to me was what I looked for. That's awesome. Yeah. But if the script is not working and you're coming onto a show yeah. that's established, that's got had great, great episodes, but you don't think you have like a if you script. didn't like your homeland episode, can you go, ah, I'll rather wait till well, a better I, I, one comes I will down say the with the, I will say this homeland episode was not the best they've had. Because they were giving those, of course, to the producers and stuff. So that was a tough one to kind of live through. But, but, and they, so why? That's what I'm you asking have to, you. You have to David. make the most of it. You've, you've got enough money that right. you can do whatever the hell you want. Right. Do you just love the action of being on a set? Because it, it's a really hard thing to direct an episode of television. It's a really hard yeah. job. And, and it, some might say you're underpaid to do that. Right. So what makes you go in and go, I'm, I'm going, I'm doing this pilot, I'm doing this episode. Do you just love being on the set that much and, and working with all these different things? It's interesting. Um, uh, we did a thing on a DGA uh, talk and answer with like, maybe four or five directors and everyone was on uh, remote access. We started talking and so forth and people were saying how I'm this and I'm that and I'm this and I'm that. And I leaned back to them and I kind of said, guys, Oh, and I came up to what happens, and one of the questions was, David, how um, how do you get up for something? How do you um, if it's not if you don't have the the juices or something, whatever? And I and this is right about a time when my wife had just passed away from uh, pancreatic cancer, and but a year earlier, I, two years earlier, and I hadn't told anybody this, I came down with Parkinson's disease, and so the thing of it was is I realized that when I'm on the set. When I'm doing this, I have no pain in my joints. And nothing hurts. I feel like a million dollars. I feel like a young man. I'm doing what I love to do. And I think that this project that I just did is a love letter to my wife. The only uh, time traveler's wife. That's really amazing. It really, it really is. A, and and I, it's also personal to me. It's not a job. I don't know how to do that. Right. And I, mean, I got to be honest with you, David, I, 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 I feel that in you. and Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you can feel it's visceral. You know, and I right. know because Connolly and I, we're very similar. And, and a lot of times it's, uh, it's the anxiety of it that stops us potentially from doing more things than we probably should have done. But exactly what you said, when we were, we were just on the set the other day, which, you know, I've been on a set 10 days over the last seven years. Right. And I do. I feel at home. Yeah. And it makes me go... This is what I would love to be doing every day, and the, the the grind to get there though is 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 what's challenging. And you've obviously ever come in, and it's amazing, and you can feel it. And I just want to give you a little little story that you don't know. But when we were looking for a director for the Entourage pilot, we're just like everybody's pa- everybody passed on it. And I get uh, this call that they're friends with. Uh, they know David Frankel well at HBO, right. and they think they can get him to do it. But I got to call him now. I still am, I, I want to check up on him. I call David Schwimmer, who did Band of Brothers, and right. I say, uh, "How's David Frankel?" He says he's a fucking genius. You would be so lucky to get him. And by the way, David Frankel is a genius, and he I was is, lucky very to get him. Much so. But I, uh, as David Frankel walks into the office to talk to me about the Entourage pilot, my phone rings, and it's David Schwimmer. And I, I go, oh, look. And I hand it to David Frankel. I go, it's David Schwimmer. And I see the look on David Frankel's face like, why am I giving him this phone? Why? Well, that, yeah, that's and, a terrible thing to do to somebody. And, and, then, and then I see them sort of like, hey, hey, hey. And I realize they don't know who they are. David Schwimmer was talking about you. Uh, <laughs> you did Band of Brothers with yeah, David yeah, Schwimmer. Yeah, of course, so yeah. he thought... David I Nutter, said David Nutter. David Frankel. So right, now David Frankel was great, and they got it. <laughs> it happen, but but Schwimmer was recommending Nutter? 100%. But that's hilarious. 100%. That's and going, oh, my God, he's amazing. And I remember him telling me, he's on the set. He's fucking this and making everything happen. So he, that's he, good, that's he good loved story. you very much on Qu- Band of Brothers. A question for, for you. Last, la- last question, David. So before we started rolling, we were talking a little bit about, you know, the, like you're talking about time travel's wife, and we're talking about responses. And, and I always thought about this with Game of Thrones. Personally, I, I didn't have I loved the ending of Game of Thrones. I, I think that they were an impossible were in an impossible situation at the height of social media. You were just not going to satisfy the the wolf pack that is social media. They, they, they were, the heat was coming no matter what. I mean, I don't know what how they could have wanted it to end. Whatever you could have a problem, but I think a big part of that was just kind of social media. Just backlash in general. And you talk, mentioned a little bit about response that comes from social media. How does that change 
the game, uh, the, the social media response, and is that play into anything, or how, how much does that? There's no way it plays into David count? Nutter's life. Not David no, no, Nutter. it actually, it actually has really come into play recently. But um, um, I have to say, in, in season eight of Game of Thrones, there are so many people that were so invested in the show, right? Personally, emotionally, that they all had their own endings, right? You know, there were, there are people I know that had like uh, Danny Targaryen. Uh, named the children after Danny, you know, and then she became a, a, a bad person. Oh my right. God, how, how do I, <laughs> how do I call her that? But uh, so, but it's a situation in which, when everyone wants their ending, you can't you can't satisfy everyone. There's no right. way to do that. Right. Um, but recently, on Time Traveler's Wife, there's a mention of the word grooming in a novel where the, the hero, Theo James Henry, is meeting with the younger version of of the character Claire, which is of course. Rose Leslie from Game of Thrones. And people started talking about uh, the grooming part and so forth and thought this was kind of like a, um, it was, to me it was, a, those are weak and lazy reviewers. Yeah. Who basically right. saw something from the book and kind of jumped on that. Right. And I think that's a misnomer. And also it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's an attack on creativity. Yeah. In right. many respects. Well, they're, not, they're not, they're not critiquing what we're doing. They're critiquing what they read. Well, there's clearly, listen, the PC culture, which is not necessarily new, even though everyone thinks it, it just well, it's came just out heightened today. with the, the internet. Right? But it, it's very heightened, and every every review seems to lean on looking at things like that, which is which is it's a shame because sure. obviously when the book was written, that word didn't mean what it means today yeah. to, to whoever, and, and that's a shame. And I don't believe that most people watch. Stuff like that. I think that is critics that are in their, of course, in in their magazines, and they're supposed to find their fucking stupid PC. Their hot take, but or, or they follow a big critic and kind of go his way, whatever. Because I'm be sure about. when you you were you read the book and you're re reading the scripts, it never entered your mind that that's what they're talking about because yeah. it wasn't what they were talking about. Sure. You know, I watched. Uh, I haven't seen Valley Girl in 30 years. I watched the movie two nights ago, and like, there's a scene where. The guy is chasing a girl around a car, and she's like, stop, stop. And, <laughs> and you know in 1980, people thought it was kind of cute. And now you're watching it going, like, what's this guy's endgame? Is he <laughs> going to, like, catch her and rape her? Like, <laughs> right. But it's just times have changed, and right. people look at things very differently. But I, I, I just I think, think the social media aspect of it is just, just jumps all over it. And, and I don't think that there was an ending. That would have made people no, happy with Game of Thrones. No way. Well, no way. I what I will say, and I don't want to because what I was trying to say earlier, to me, the script, the best director in the world cannot make um, a bad script great. No. So that's why I was asking what they can do. My personal opinion, the book ran out in Game of Thrones. To me, season eight, it wasn't that I was expecting some ending. It just had a different pace. It people were just too connected to it. No, I disagree. And David I, and Dan came in and kind of created, started, started to create the ending. Yeah, I, I, ju I just disagree. Reference. It had a different pace and a different tone to it, and it wasn't that I was expecting any type of ending. It became a little slower I and a little this. But that's great. I and every, that's I'm a story guy. That's the difference between you and I. Yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> a, I'm an action guy. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, but I, I love gave, the green ball. How big is the green ball, the dragon? The, what, well, it the depends. Ball? It can be a basketball. It can be like a tennis ball. Yeah. Right? No, like, not a exactly. it's not going to be a tennis. It's like well, a beach ball. And, 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 I think mean, Jurassic Park. It can be a I remember. Too. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. It depends how close it is. But it was, it was a moment in uh, when, when Stephen goes up and touches the uh, touches the dragon pets, I guess. And so they have a green shaped uh, head or something that she can <laughs> touch and sit Jesus. on top of. And it's just so wild. Now, fly. when you're directing that episode, are you still <clears> around when all the CGI and, and uh, FX comes in? Are you still there or you're off on Homeland He's while that's going? No, no, I, I, I'm there to give my cut. But, but, but the big visual effects take so long. You can't really hang out for all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's, re it's really a wild process. I, I should have asked you if I could follow you around Game of Thrones. Mark Mylad also did Game of Thrones. Oh, episodes. he's a great director. Yeah. I actually, uh, uh, he was the first guy I recommended to them to hire. Yeah. And I was glad they took my opinion. Wow. Took my voice a little bit. Nice. Yeah, that's great. Well, David, I mean, you've Very had, informative episode. Yeah, you've had such an amazing career. Me and Connolly both feel like losers because we've yeah, basically done say, nothing. Doug, where were you yeah. when he was working on The Mentalist? I guess that's the question. <laughs> I was. And uh, sad to say, that was one in which... They were trying to give us David Schwimmer, and we said, um, <clears throat> we think Simon Baker's the guy. Is that, is that right? Yeah. 
But David wouldn't have done it anyway, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I don't know, but that's that's interesting. I mean, but your career is amazing, and Thank of you so course, much. I'm, I'm, you know, well, I'm, listen, I, I'm on, on, Entourage was a huge part of that, and I think that working with you guys made me a much better director, and it was a great experience to do it. And and it, it, one of the things that people always ask me about the the success of the show, and I would say, the success the success of the show is this: these are a band of brothers. These guys love each other no matter what and are behind each other and will care for each other no matter what. And you don't get that. That's special. We all dream of that. And that's what made that show special. Yeah. Well, I, lo- I love that you, you take that from it because that was my intention from the start. And uh, I, sp- I spoke to you a couple of years ago when your wife passed. And again, I'm yeah. so sorry about that. And um, you. your, your passion, and I think for anyone listening out there, that's what you need to work like David does, who does not need to work ever again in his life. And uh, it, it's inspiring to me. It really it really is. And, and I thank you. I'm excited to watch Time Traveler's Wife. Yeah, it's a Time Traveler's Wife time. on HBO. Sunday night till 9 o'clock and then anytime you want to watch it. Yeah, it's all on now. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to start that tonight. And uh, Before we wrap this up, I can't believe we were going to wrap this up without talking about this. Doug. Take it away. Well, two things. Number one, I wanted to get your, your take on your first episode of directing, but also... Victory, the podcast, exists. David went out, and uh, it was his episode that was the Grand Canyon, and just shot the hell out of one of the most iconic moments of our show. And at the same day, I don't even know if you know this, David, and don't tell me you directed that episode, too, but Tony Soprano that night was at the Grand Canyon. Sunday night on HBO, they both were at the Grand Canyon, which is so fucking (laughs) bizarre. But anyway, I'd love to hear about your, your first episode of Entourage, and then that... Grand Canyon kind of episode. Well, as was interesting. My first episode of Entourage, I was shooting it right in the beginning of the year, January. But prior to that, I was in uh, Vail, Colorado, skiing with my family, and I went down the hill and tripped and broke six ribs Jeez. on my left side. So I basically had my pain medicine with me in my pocket, and I said, off we go. So I drank that full whole first episode, totally whacked. I don't <laughs> even remember it was, per- it was more perfect because it was about the, uh, <clears throat> what's the name's calves? Dylan's yeah, about Bill yeah, 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 the Cavs was fantastic. That was the new, that was the episode Jamie, we were on the beach yeah. with Jamie Presley, yeah, 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 Jamie Presley. the bonfire, the yeah, big exactly. party. Right. Yes, exactly. And uh, that was the one which um, I remember uh, uh, how we're going to talk to each other. I remember I sat at my little monitors behind the actors, kind of looking up and be doing whatever new directing from there because going to raise or something. It was crazy. I mean, that's what I'm saying about you, David. Like you have six cracked ribs. It's like an episode of television that you don't need to be doing and you just want to keep working. I had to do it. It was, it was so, so, such a pleasure. Such a treat. That's awesome. That was a good that episode. Was, but and yeah. tell us the, the Grand Canyon part. Of, what, are, what, are, what are your memories of that besides you and Dylan and Gary in the helicopter flying back on, yeah, on a exactly. scary flight? That was a very scary flight. No, I, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think to me it was really a situation in which, you know, Johnny Jamad was a dreamer, and we're all dreamers. And he basically, this was his chance to, to really go, to really shine. And he was so fearful. Uh, the first scene is when he goes in, as he has what they want for breakfast, and he goes, oh, everything will be just fine. And all of a sudden, a, a pigeon flies in through the window. We talked about that. We don't know what that was based on. <laughs> uh, whatever it was, it was fantastic. <laughs> but, but it gets to the very end of the episode, and he's going off to I think, do a thumb on Louise, and what happens is he wakes <laughs> up. And how he shot it was the fact that we wanted to basically set up the car and set him up in the car. As he starts to get up, we would, sorry, as he starts to get up, we would kind of um, discover, as he discovers, your guy's attitude. So, of course, Aiden came out and started talking about, are you going to come with your brother to make a breakfast? Right. And, add in. And, then, and then the agent comes in and basically says, it's a huge hit. And as that all happened, Johnny would kind of stand up and we could start to realize where he's at. We start to realize where he's at. And... At the end, you know, it was a beautiful sunset shot, and he basically right there, and and he looked out, and it was so beautifully done. Uh, uh, Rob uh, Sweeney. Rob Sweeney. Rob Sweeney, Sweeney. Sweeney. Rob Sweeney. Sweeney. Sweeney did a like great work. job shooting. He was actually on a crane out over the Grand Canyon. Oh, my God. The crane would have dropped. He would have fallen to his death. <laughs> oh, God. And we had this great shot of him in the victory, and it was just like, it was so massive and so epic and so profound and I think it had a lot to do with the show again. A dream's coming true for these guys. It really was. And awesome. them all supporting him. And we were we were talking about it with Dylan last week, you know. Um you set that car up so close yeah, to the edge. And Gary, oh, Dylan. Gary, Gary, did, Gary did it all. Gary put it in there. He got it in there right close. We were right, very close. It you was, know, we were saying there's also one of the surprises as I was we we're explaining to people listening, like what a skeleton crew is. So you guys sort of left us all behind, and you went out and shot that. And when you guys came back with that footage, 
I just remember it was like, what the f- Fuck, yeah. man. How did these guys, A, where are they? B, how did they get, I figured it was a crane, you know, it just big, wide shots. And it just, it just was, uh, I just remember the excitement on Doug and Lev when you guys just come back. They don't yeah. know what's going on. And yeah. all of a sudden, here you guys come back with this, this magical footage that's iconic and still to this day plays on, on, uh, on scoreboards. Uh, when professional sports teams win, oh, they, wow. they call, oh yeah. yeah. Do you oh, know yeah. that? Oh, they, they, I'll give you a check for that, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, exactly, for sure. You see, Nutter knows what's up. He's like, yeah, I guess they should get That's great. Yeah, they play it on scoreboards. After big wins in sports, they have, you know, Dylan dropping to his knees and screaming victory. Yeah, it so. happens fantastic. all the time. I know that the Lightning, the Lightning do it. No, the Rays. No, the, the Rays, the Rays do, it. do it all yeah, the yeah, time. That's so, great. So, yeah. Good All right, stuff. well, David, it was uh, again. You're you're awesome, and I hope you're feeling good. And um, you know, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. Good to see ho- you guys. Hopefully, too. we'll get you. Hopefully, we'll get you in to do a ramble on episode. Yes, you know, and, uh, sounds I want to me. I want to show you a cut of that. Sounds so, great. Thanks for coming in, and everybody will be back next week with Victory the Podcast. Thank you.